Uh, but we have to start tonight with a little bit of breaking news. It is not often that news breaks on the opinion pages of a major newspaper. Uh, that, that, that is what has just happened tonight uh, in the New York Times. Within the past hour, the New York Times has just posted this from Glenn Simpson and Peter Fritsch. They're the two former Wall Street Journal reporters who founded a Washington, D.C.-based research firm uh, called Fusion GPS. Now, Fusion was a low-profile research firm until a year ago, a year ago this month, um, when BuzzFeed published a dossier of alleged Russian dirt on Donald Trump and his campaign. Uh, detailed allegations about the Russian government intervening in the election to help Trump win, that dossier was compiled by a respected former MI6 British spy, Christopher Steele. But the firm that paid him to do it was Fusion GPS. Now, the Trump White House and Trump-supporting Republicans in Congress have since tried to make that dossier itself a scandal. Uh, they've tried to make Fusion itself a scandal. Uh, they've tried to discredit the whole special counsel, Robert Mueller-led investigation into the Trump potential, the potential of Trump campaign collusion with Russia. They've tried to turn that uh, into something that is discredited by its association with the dossier. Um, but two things have now just happened that are putting a, a real wrench in those works in terms of how the Republicans are trying to fend off the Russia investigation and the Mueller probe in particular. Now, one of them is this new op-ed, which has just dropped at the New York Times website within the past hour. And like I say, it's, it's weird for news to break on the opinion pages of a newspaper, but there are a few bombshells here. Um, first of all, Fusion's founders are calling for the release of the transcripts of their 21 hours of testimony before three different congressional committees. Now, if you have been watching the show for a while, you will remember that this is an issue that we've been following for a while. Um, we first started talking about these transcripts after Glenn Simpson, Fusion founder, gave 10 hours of testimony to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Now, Senator Chuck Grassley is the head of that committee, and he said publicly at the time that, yeah, the transcript of that testimony would be released to the public. He was asked about it at a town hall at home in Iowa, and he said it, it, the transcript would just need to be cleared through Fusion, cleared through their lawyers to make sure there wasn't anything in there that needed to be redacted. But then once that process was done, he didn't see any reason why that transcript could not be released to the American people. Now, we reported several weeks ago that that process uh, was complete that that review to see if anything needed to be redacted from the transcript, that was done. So we reported several weeks ago that Senator Grassley was free to release that transcript like he said he would. He has not released that transcript. Now, the whole reason we made an issue of it, the whole reason I've been talking about it on the air, the whole reason I've been interested to see it, and I think you would be too, is because this was 10 hours of sworn testimony behind closed doors, we didn't get to see it when it happened, but it was 10 hours of sworn testimony about that Trump-Russia dossier by the firm that commissioned it. And the firm at the time said that they stood by the dossier, they stood by its veracity. So that's interesting, right? I mean, the Republicans have tried to say that the dossier is some sort of terrible scandal, it's, dodge, it's dodgy, it's trash, it's all of these other bad things, and any association with that dossier absolutely discredits the FBI if they use the dossier at all to start its investigation. Here's the guys who paid for the work that led to the dossier saying, actually, we know better than anybody what's in there and we stand by it, and then giving 10 hours initially of sworn testimony to back that up. Wouldn't you want to see what they had to say to back it up? So when we first found out there was a transcript and Fusion would be okay with it being released, obviously we wanted to see it. We wanted to see what testimony these guys were able to give to support these claims. But we still haven't seen those 10 hours of transcripts from the Judiciary Committee, nor have we seen transcripts from the other two Republican-led committees where Fusion has been called in to testify. But again, tonight in the New York Times, Fusion is calling for those to be released and they are putting some icing on that cake. Quote, we walked investigators in these congressional, uh, congressional hearings. We walked investigators through our year-long effort to decipher Mr. Trump's complex business past, of which the Steele dossier is, one is but one chapter. Republicans have refused to release full transcripts of our firm's testimony, even as they selectively leak details to media outlets on the far right. It's time to share what our company told investigators. And then in this op-ed, just released tonight at the New York Times, 
they do that. At least they share some of what their company has told investigators. And this is all stuff we have not heard before. This is all new. Quote, we suggested investigators look into the bank records of Deutsche Bank and others that were funding Mr. Trump's businesses. Congress appears uninterested in that tip. Reportedly, our bank records, meaning Fusion's bank records, are the only bank records the House Intelligence Committee has subpoenaed. Also, quote, we told Congress that from Manhattan to Sunny Isles Beach, Florida, and from Toronto to Panama, we found widespread evidence that Trump and his organization had worked with a wide array of dubious Russians in arrangements that often raise questions about money laundering. Likewise, those deals don't seem to interest Congress. Also, quote, we explained how, from our past journalistic work in Europe, we were deeply familiar with the political operative Paul Manafort's coziness with Moscow and his financial ties to Russian oligarchs close to Vladimir Putin. Yes, we hired Christopher Steele, a highly respected Russia expert, but we did so without informing Steele whom we were working for and we gave him no specific marching orders beyond this basic question. Why did Mr. Trump repeatedly seek to do deals in a notoriously corrupt police state that most serious investors shun? What came back shocked us. Mr. Steele's sources in Russia, who were not paid, reported on an extensive and now confirmed effort by the Kremlin to help elect Mr. Trump president. Mr. Steele saw this as a crime in progress and decided he needed to report it to the FBI. We did not discuss that decision with our clients or anyone else. Instead, we deferred to Mr. Steele, a trusted friend and intelligence professional with a long history of working with law enforcement. We did not speak to the FBI, and we haven't since. Quote, after the election, Mr. Steele decided to share his intelligence with Senator John McCain via an emissary. We helped him do that. The goal was to alert the U.S. national security community to an attack on our country by a hostile foreign power. We did not, however, share the dossier with BuzzFeed, which to our dismay published it last January. We're extremely proud of our work to highlight Mr. Trump's Russia ties. To have done so is our right under the First Amendment. The public still has much to learn about a man with the most troubling business past of any U.S. president. Congress should release transcripts of our firm's testimony so that the American people can learn the truth about our work and, most importantly, what happened to our democracy. Again, this is coming tonight from the two founders of Fusion GPS. They say they have given these Republican-led committees in Congress information on, on Trump's relationship with Deutsche Bank, on business dealings by the Trump Organization that raised questions about money laundering. Uh, they say they did not want the dossier published. They say that the Russian sources for Christopher Steele in the dossier were not paid. They say they didn't want the dossier published when BuzzFeed published it. They say they did help get it into the hands of Senator John McCain through an emissary. They say they did not meet themselves with the FBI. And then there's this one last thing. Quote, we don't believe the Steele dossier was the trigger for the FBI's investigation into Russian meddling. As we told the Senate Judiciary Committee in August, our sources said the dossier was taken so seriously because it corroborated reports the FBI had received from other sources, including one inside the Trump camp. Now, that last claim from this, again, op-ed piece, weird place to break news, but that's where it's breaking tonight in the New York Times. That last claim that the Christopher Steele dossier wasn't what started the FBI's counterintelligence investigation into whether or not the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. We are now learning tonight that the guys behind the dossier told the Senate that in August. Maybe that's why the Republicans in the Senate don't want to release those transcripts. Um, but we've also just had a big new piece of public reporting that corroborates that as well. And that is not from the op-ed pages, but from the reporting pages of the New York Times. This bombshell story which doesn't just say that the dossier isn't why the FBI started its counterintelligence operation. This New York Times story explains what did lead to the FBI counterintelligence investigation. According to the Times, Trump foreign policy advisor George Papadopoulos, who's now cooperating with the Mueller investigation, <laughs> according to the Times, he got drunk in London last May. And on a drinking binge at a, uh, in, in Kensington in London, he told a top Australian diplomat that Russia had dirt on Hillary Clinton and thousands of stolen Democratic emails. Now, that washes over us now because we now know, of course, that that's true. But in May of last year, nobody knew that. In May of last year, even the DNC didn't know that their emails had been stolen. 
But Russia knew that they had stolen them. Russia knew that they had hacked into the DNC. And apparently this guy Papadopoulos from the Trump campaign knew it too and bragged about it. And who knows if the Australians even believed him when he first said it on this drunken evening in London last May. But two months later, when Russia, in fact, started circulating its stolen Democratic and Clinton campaign emails, well, then Australia realized that this drunk braggart actually had some inside information. And the Australians called the FBI. Quote, the hacking and the revelation that a member of the Trump campaign may have had inside information about it were driving factors that led the FBI to open an investigation in July 2016 into Russia's attempts to disrupt the election and whether any of Pre President Trump's associates conspired. It was not, as Trump and other politicians have alleged, a dossier compiled by a former British spy hired by a rival campaign. Instead, it was firsthand information from one of America's closest intelligence allies. So says this new reporting from the New York Times this weekend, and so says the firm that paid for the dossier as of just about one hour ago tonight. Joining us now is Mark Mazzetti, Washington Investigations Editor for the New York Times. Mr. Mazzetti, it's really nice uh, to have you here tonight. Thanks very much for being here. Thanks, Rachel. Good to be back. So um, let me see if I understand the, 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 both the drama and the implications of this pretty incredible piece of reporting that you guys have now published. The drama involves the sort of human interaction between this campaign foreign policy advisor, George Papadopoulos, and an Australian diplomat who didn't react initially to what Papadopoulos was telling him as if it was something red hot, as if it was something potentially damning. Part of what you guys report is that there was a delay of a couple months before Australia saw this as important enough information to deliver to U.S. authorities, right? Right. So the, uh, the drinking session in London happened in May of 2016. This was a couple weeks after, according to Mueller's documents, uh, Papadopoulos learned about this Russian dirt, uh, the dirt that Russians had on Hillary Clinton, from this London professor who was apparently some kind of a Russian cutout. So he talks to the Australian, Alexander Downer, uh, in May of 2016, but it's not until two months later, July 2016, when Downer, in a cable, relays this uh, to other parts of his government, and then that is relayed to the FBI. And that is one, as we said, of the driving factors that leads the FBI to launch the investigation the end of that month. Now, it's around the same time, as we, of course, remember, when these DNC emails are leaking out on the eve of the Democratic Convention. So it is possible, though we haven't confirmed this yet, that this becomes public and the Australian government realizes what's, what it's sitting on and it notifies the U.S. government. Because what was damning here in particular was the timing. As I said, now we're hearing, oh, the Russians had tons of stolen emails, they had dirt on Hillary Clinton. We've heard so much about that, it kind of washes over us. But in May 2016, there was no public information that anything had been stolen, that the Russians had been involved in any sort of uh, disinformation campaign about Clinton. That, was, that would have been, that would have either sounded crazy or it would have at least sounded like news at that time, right? Right. I mean, certainly it was not, people were not focused on it at all, uh, nearly to the extent that we are now or even have been for the last year. Uh, I think, you know, Papadopoulos mentioning this, uh, it may not have raised the alarms as it, you know, it did a couple, a couple of months later. Why this drinking session happened, why Papadopoulos met with the Australian, uh, is still a little unclear. I mean, remember, he had just been named two months earlier as a member of Trump's foreign policy team. So it's possible that as a man living in London, uh, some diplomats from, you know, close American allies might want to get a feel for the, the candidate and his team. Uh, but, but again, that's a little bit of speculation. Um, what's obviously more important is, is the, rela the information that was conveyed and where it went from there. Now, one of the crucial questions here, if Mr. Papadopoulos does, if you, as you reported, if he did have advanced knowledge of what the Russians had done uh, in their intervention into the election, and he knew about that months before any of that was public, the question is whether or not he was a lone actor, whether he had that alone, whether he shared that information with the Trump campaign, whether he ever discussed that information with the Trump campaign. You do say at one point in your reporting that while he continued to, for months to try to arrange meetings between the Trump campaign and the and the Russian government he kept senior campaign advisors abreast of those efforts to set up a meeting but do we know if he was in communication with anybody else in the Trump world um, about his information about what the Russians were doing to intervene in the campaign 
We know from both uh, documents that Mueller's put out, as well as some uh, emails that we quote in our story, that Papadopoulos was keeping the campaign, including Stephen Miller and others, informed about what he was hearing, particularly about uh, trying to set up a meeting between Trump and uh, Putin. Uh, the day after he hears about these emails, he sends a note to Miller basically saying, I'm hearing some interesting messages about this possible meeting. Now, I should be clear, there is no public evidence now uh, yet that he told anyone in the campaign about the emails or this alleged dirt. Uh, the Mueller documents are silent on that. You know, recall, it was in October when these documents came out where we first learned about Papadopoulos' role and we first learned about that that he had been told uh, about uh, this dirt and these thousands of emails. But those documents are silent on this issue of did he tell anyone, and it's still a little unclear. One last quick question for you, Mark, and it's about um, a speech. Uh, from your reporting, Mr. Papadopoulos was trusted enough to edit the outline of Mr. Trump's first major foreign policy speech on April 27, an address in which the candidate said it was possible to improve relations with Russia. Mr. Papadopoulos flagged the speech to his newfound Russia contacts, telling one of them that it should be taken, quote, as the signal to meet. What does that mean? Good question. Uh, I mean, read one way, it means, uh, I, you know, he is trying to broker this meeting, which he thinks is going to basically make him in the campaign. He's starting out as an advisor, uh, very low profile. No one really is, has, has heard of him. And if he brokers this meeting, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be big for his career and his, and his life in the campaign. Now, it's possible read that one way. He's, you know, the speech which, which gave some uh, positive uh, signs about where Trump would be as president towards Russia, that he's using that as you know, a signal that you know, Trump wants to meet Putin for uh, you know, maybe nothing nefarious, maybe just a, a public meeting to discuss uh, uh, policy and other topics. Uh, it is certainly cryptic. It's certainly something we'll be looking at further. But at this point, it's a little bit of speculation what really he means there. Mark Mazzetti, Washington Investigations Editor for The New York Times. Red hot reporting here. Thanks for helping us uh, understand what it means. Really appreciate you being here. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks. All right. Big night. Uh, lots to cut to tonight. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.